On behalf of the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, I want to welcome you to this presentation on Book 4 of Andrea Palladio's famous 1570 treatise, The Four Books on Architecture. For brevity, I will refer to it either as Quattro Libre or just the four books. I'm Calder Loos, an architectural historian. I currently serve as Vice President of the Center for Palladian Studies in America, so I have a special interest in Palladio and his influence, especially on the architecture of our country. Palladio's Quattro Libre can justly claim to be the most influential treatise on architecture ever written. It has gone through countless editions over the centuries and is still available in inexpensive reprint. Now, in assembling this presentation, I'm especially indebted to Robert Taverner's and Richard Schofield's invaluable translation and annotation of Palladio's 1570 edition of the four books, or Quattro Libri, an essential reference. While this presentation will explore the impact and influence of Quattro Libri's book four, before we do so, I think it would be helpful to look briefly at the other three books of Palladio's treatise. For context. And before we start, I should note that the dates and the captions for most of the buildings I will be showing are generally accepted completion dates. Many of these buildings took many years to build. So, Book 1. We see on the title page that Palladio begins his section with a brief discourse on the five orders. This is the meat of Book 1. And the clarity and precision of Palladio's drawings, such as these of the Ionic order, coupled with the instructions on how to compose each order, have made Book One a primary textbook on the classical language for students and architects ever since. Book Two is perhaps the most popular of the four books. As noted on Book Two's title page, the book consists of Palladio's designs for houses. In fact, this was the first time any architect published a compilation of his own built works. In his engaging compositions, Palladio demonstrates how the classical language could be applied to contemporary buildings. For instance, Palladio has imbued the facade of the Villa Amo with a dignity of appearance by applying a classical portico. The Romans reserved porticos for temples and public buildings. Applying a portico to a domestic work was Palladio's innovation. We see that the Villa Amo is otherwise a relatively plain country house, but the portico signals that this is a place occupied by a person of consequence. Palladio applied porticos to most of his villa designs, and this set the precedent for affixing a portico to countless houses on both sides of the Atlantic, from Scotland to America, from sprawling mansions to the most pedestrian domicile. And now Book 3. The title page to Book 3 tells us that this book is focused on engineering works, civic buildings, and zhishti, or athletic facilities. Several of Palladio's bridge designs are modeled after ancient Roman examples. Also in Book 3 is perhaps Palladio's most famous design, the two levels of arcades he added to Vicenza's medieval basilica. The many bays in these arcades popularized the use of the Celiana, or what many now call the Palladian Arch. That is, a round arch flanked by narrow flat-top arches. Palladio didn't invent the form, the Romans used it. But the illustrations of the Basilica arcades, more than any other source, attracted attention to the motif, and associated this motif with Palladio henceforth. We see variations of it everywhere on famous landmarks such as Independence Hall, or even this early design by Frank Lloyd Wright, as well as Overkill. Well, this now brings us to the substance of this presentation, Book 4 of Palladio's Four Books on Architecture, or Quattro Libri. The introductory page for Book 4 states what this book is about, quote, in which the ancient temples in Rome and some others in and outside Italy are described and illustrated. But before we begin our discussion of Book 4, we need to back up to explain the genesis of this section of Quattro Libri. Palladio was born in Padua in 1508 and trained as a stonemason. 
His original name was Andrea della Gondola. Now, just as Andrea was starting his trade, he made the acquaintance of Count Gian Giorgio Trissino, a wealthy patron of the arts who was building a villa for himself near Vicenza, for which Andrea was assisting. Trissino recognized that the young stonemason showed promise both as a builder and possibly an architect, so he took Andrea under his wing and became his mentor. Trissino was even inspired to change Andrea's surname to Palladio. And this was probably a reference to a character in an epic poem by Trissino, a mythical archangel named Palladio, who was an expert in architecture. And Trissino realized that anyone with aspirations to be an architect needed to visit Rome and learn from the ruins of antiquity. So in 1541, he took Palladio to Rome to begin his surveys of the ancient monuments. This was the first of Palladio's five visits to the Eternal City. And these study visits gained Palladio his encyclopedic knowledge of Roman architecture, knowledge that he would promote as design resources for new works. But we should note that when Palladio first saw Rome, it did not look like this. Instead, it was more like Piranese's view of the Forum, which hadn't much changed since Palladio saw it two centuries earlier. For more than a millennium, the Forum was used as a quarry for building materials, leaving only fragments of ancient works. Most were half buried. These were the conditions that Palladio faced as he began his study. We have this telling statement by Palladio in his foreword to Book Four which precisely defined his goal. Quote, I intend, therefore, to illustrate in this book the form and ornaments of many ancient temples, of which one can still see the ruins, and which I have recorded in drawings, so that anyone can understand the form and ornaments with which churches must be built. And although one can see only portions of some of them standing above ground, I have nonetheless proceeded to deduce from them what they must have been like when they were complete, taking into consideration the foundations that could be observed as well." Unquote. So what's he getting at? Well, let's return to Piranesi's view of the Forum and focus on three lone columns. These are all that remained of what Palladio and his contemporaries identified as the Temple of Jupiter Stator, or Jupiter the Steadfast. The scholars have since determined that it was actually the temple of Castor and Pollux, and that's how I will refer to it. We see the columns today. They and the remnants of the foundation are all that Palladio had to work with, and from them he produced this elevation, as well as a plan and details. Now, it's difficult to overstress the importance of this effort. It marked perhaps the first concentrated study in recording projects involving above-ground archaeological remains. These and the numerous other drawings spread through Brook 4 were amazing from the standpoint of their clarity, understanding, and detail. And it was a uniquely important effort since it's mainly these published drawings that first gave people a credible vision of the grandeur and beauty of ancient Roman architecture. Moreover, Palladio's drawings are a priceless documentation since some of the ruins he recorded were subsequently destroyed. The impact of these seductive drawings has been staggering. And while there have been many studies of Roman ruins since Palladio, his drawings and commentary were a primary motivation for the continuation of the classical tradition in architecture and they provided the ultimate design source and inspiration for many of the great classical works both here and abroad from that time on, as we shall see. For example, let's return to Palladio's elevation and plan of the Temple of Castor and Pollux. We see an octostyle, that is, eight columns, portico, and a peripteral temple plan, that is, freestanding columns surrounding the building's core. So these restoration drawings of the Temple of Castor and Pollux were the direct design source for England's Birmingham Town Hall down to the details of its column capitals. 
And could Palladio's images not have been the inspiration for Paris's great church of the Madeleine, a true vision of ancient Rome? The octostyle Corinthian portico has been used to provide stately entrances to a variety of building types on both sides of the Atlantic. We see it on the National Museum of Hungary in Budapest, a Baptist church in Richmond, Virginia. It celebrates the entrance to Cass Gilbert's striking West Virginia State Capitol, and also John Russell Pope's National Archives, a building on imperial scale. Now, these latter three buildings are examples of what we define as the American Renaissance of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Americans then thought of our country as a new Rome, an empire for liberty, and adopted the Roman classical image for our own. And a foremost expression of the American Renaissance is Cass Gilbert's Supreme Court building. Its temple form is consciously explicit. Ancient temples were designed to house gods. They were meant to inspire awe and fearsome reverence. And though the classical temple form developed some 3,000 years ago, we cannot help being awed today by a building that looks like this and have respect for the authority it conveys. It's an innate reaction. The Supreme Court's octostyle Corinthian portico is similar to that of the Temple of Castor and Pollux, but it more specifically alludes to Rome's Temple of Mars Altor in the form of Augustus, considered one of Rome's most imposing and beautiful temples, though little of it was left even in Palladio's time. We see a reconstruction image on the left. The view on the right is how it appears today, not much left, and that's about all Palladio saw. The temple became a popular subject for more erudite conjectural reconstruction exercises by Beaux-Arts architects and students. Typical is this carefully delineated rendering of 1843 showing the Corinthian portico as the dominant element of the composition. However, the primary reference for the temple's original appearance is Palladio's reconstruction drawing in Quattro Libre's Book Four. We see on the left of Palladio's two-page spread four of the columns of the temple's octostyle portico, and this book-ended view of Mars Altor and the Supreme Court reveals the two works matching characters. While the temples of Castor and Pollux and Mars Altor were certainly grandiose, they were not ancient Rome's most grandiose. Dominating Rome's Quirinal Hill was the mighty temple complex of Isis and Serapis, dedicated to the cult worshipping of these two Egyptian deities. However, in Palladio's time, the temple was thought to be the Temple of Jupiter. And this 1629 print shows generally how Palladio would have found it. Little more than a corner of the pediment, along with a jumble of foundations and scattered fragments, remained. Undaunted, Palladio produced restoration drawings as he determined it would have appeared. This spread in Quattro Libre shows half of the portico and half of an interior section. Now note the six columns. That's just half of the portico. Palladio's plan reveals how immense this complex was. If we look at the bottom of the plan, we see that the portico was 12 columns wide, termed dodeca style. Do meaning two, deca meaning ten, and style meaning column, in other words, 12 columns. Dodeca style was generally the maximum size of a classical portico. Later architects occasionally attempted dodeca style porticos. Two prominent examples are the Palais Bourbon, or National Assembly Building in Paris, and the two pavilions of the sprawling Admiralty Complex in St. Petersburg, employing a Doric order. Okay, we'll now switch to a much smaller temple surveyed by Palladio, one dating from the Roman Republic. It was long believed that this was the Temple of Fortuna Virilis, or Manly Virtue, but scholars have since determined it was dedicated to Portunus, the god of ports. The temple is near the Tiber River, at the former port where goods were transported to and from the city, and it was situated in the Forum Boarium, the ancient cattle market. 
This view by Piranesi shows the temple as Palladio likely found it. Its portico was encased when the building was converted many years ago to an early Christian church and attached to later buildings. Palladio's careful study of the altered structure enabled him to produce this reasonably reliable image of the facade's original appearance, dominated by its tetrastyle, or four-column portico. The temple was restored in the 1930s, which included opening up the portico. We see its appealing compact form as it appears today. Palladio's and later depictions of the temple have directly and indirectly inspired various versions of buildings with tetra-style ionic porticos. One of the more verbatim adaptations is the 18th century Temple of Harmony, an ornamental garden pavilion at Hallswell House in England. In Charleston, an engaged tetra-style ionic portico defines the facade of South Carolina's 18th century state house. And just a block away, this Charleston bank sports a finely developed freestanding ionic portico, recalling that of Portunus. And the temple's compact scale and timeless character even made it an attractive model for a mausoleum. Now, of course, we must bring Thomas Jefferson into the discussion. In his design for the University of Virginia complex, Jefferson provided models of classical architecture for the edification of the students. The facades of the ten faculty pavilions stretched along the lawn were rendered in different versions of the orders. Jefferson directly quoted the portico of the Temple of Fortuna Verilis or Portunus for the university's pavilion two. On the left is Jefferson's own drawing of the facade on which he wrote, Ionic of Fortuna Verilis. The photograph of the pavilion on the right shows how close it is in appearance and scale to its ancient inspiration. Jefferson even adapted Palladio's depiction of the temple's ornamented frieze for pavilion two. However, for the orders of most of the other pavilions, Jefferson relied either on Palladio's book one or Roland Freyard de Chambray's parallel of architecture. But for the attic of Pavilion 10, he referred to Palladio's Book 4. The attic is based on Palladio's depiction of the Temple of Nerva Trajan in the Forum of Nerva, published in Book 4. We see the attic on the wing flanking the portico, and a photo of what remains of it today. The attic is clearly shown in a watercolor drawing of Pavilion 10 by John Nielsen, Jefferson's principal builder, and in a photo of Pavilion 10 today with its imposing attic. All right, we now need to turn our attention to the Pantheon. Palladio devoted 12 pages of text and drawings to the Pantheon. His woodcut illustrations in Book 4 were the first reliably accurate published depictions of the Pantheon, the most spectacular of all ancient Roman structures, and one of the most intact. Though he never visited Rome, Jefferson was intrigued by the Pantheon. It was the inspiration for the focal point of his university scheme, the Rotunda. Jefferson designed the Rotunda to house the library making it a temple of learning. The Rotunda is a half-scale version of the Pantheon, which Jefferson knew from Book 4. I'm showing the Pantheon from Giacomo Leone's 1715 English-language edition of Quattro Libre. Its handsome copper plate engravings, as opposed to Palladio's original woodcuts, were Jefferson's principal reference for Palladio's images. Jefferson was especially drawn to the Pantheon's spherical proportions. Its interior dimensions could be described in a sphere. Jefferson adapted that effect for the rotunda. Its diameter and height were approximately half those of the Pantheon. We see this in Jefferson's own elevation and section drawings. The rotunda today is a handsome, balanced composition. Not a copy of the Pantheon, but a refined reference to it. Its smaller size required a hexastyle, or six-column portico, rather than the octastyle portico of the Pantheon. J 
Jefferson's rotunda spread the fashion for Pantheon-like signature buildings in university campuses around the country. Two examples are Dallas Hall at Southern Methodist University and the Moorhead Planetarium at the University of North Carolina. And the firm of McKinbead and White more directly relied on the Pantheon as inspiration in its design of the Gould Memorial Library at New York University, now Bronx Community College. The firm also turned to the Pantheon for inspiration in its design for a bank, the Girard Trust Company building in downtown Philadelphia, a forceful expression of the American Renaissance. Perhaps the latest and certainly one of the most distinguished expressions of the American Renaissance is John Russell Pope's Jefferson Memorial. With his design, Pope fused the Pantheon and Jefferson's Rotunda into a single symbolic monument. Looking abroad, a strikingly creative interpretation of the Pantheon is the Church of San Francesco di Paola in Naples, Italy. Its massive dome is flanked by two chapel domes. The church took 20 years to build, finally completed in 1846, and its rich domed interior has much the character of the Pantheon. Now, the most literal version of the Pantheon is the mausoleum of Rosa Vericellana in Turin. Rosa Vericellana was the morganatic wife of King Umberto of Italy. Because she was not of royal blood, she was not permitted to be buried in the actual Pantheon in Rome next to her husband. Hence, her burial place was honored in Turin with a half-sized copy of the Pantheon, a little-known but attention-grabbing landmark. A dominant feature of the Pantheon's interior is the dome's coffered ceiling, a marvel of ancient cast concrete construction. The coffers are both decorative and a means to lighten the dome's massive weight. Palladio duly illustrated the coffering in his section of the Pantheon's interior in Book 4. The Pantheon's ceiling has inspired numerous imitations. America's first was the dome designed by Charles Bullfinch for the United States Capitol, finished in 1829. The dome completed the scheme originally planned by William Thornton, although Bullfinch's dome was taller than Thornton's proposed lower saucer dome. Bullfinch's dome made for an impressive interior space, but it was short-lived. It was replaced by Thomas U. Walter's present and much loftier cast iron dome, completed in 1865. Nonetheless, not far away, we can see a nearly identical treatment of the Pantheon's coffering in the dome of the National Gallery of Art, another masterpiece by John Russell Pope. And the museum's domed exterior also references the Pantheon. Now, we need to return once again to Mr. Jefferson to discuss what is likely his most influential architectural work. As introduction, we'll look at the Maison Carrée, the Roman temple in Nîmes, France, considered the best preserved of all Roman temples, and one of the several ancient works outside of Rome surveyed by Palladio. Jefferson was first introduced to the Maison Carrée through Palladio's Book IV, but his attraction was not through the woodcut prints in the early editions of Quattro Libre, rather as we noted with the Pantheon, the crisp copper plate engravings from the 1715 Leone edition of Palladio's four books. Jefferson acquired the Leone edition as early as 1769. Well, to make a long story short, the Maison Carré's temple form served as the inspiration for Jefferson's design for the Virginia State Capitol. This was the first instance where the Republican form of government was given specific architectural expression, creating a temple of democracy. The capital was actually designed in Paris while Jefferson was serving as our ambassador to France. With the assistance of French architect Charles-Louis Clarisseau, he worked up the drawings for the capital and sent them from Paris to Richmond in 1786, along with a model executed by the famous French model maker Jean-Pierre Fouquet. So Jefferson did not actually see the Maison Carré until 1787, after his drawings and model were shipped. 
But Jefferson was no less beguiled by the temple's beauty when he finally saw it, writing a friend that he gazed at it long hours like a lover at his mistress. Again, Jefferson's capital is not a copy of the Maison Carré, but a specific evocation of its ancient temple form, an acknowledgment that classical architecture was the foundation of the architecture of Western civilization and the ideal model for the architecture of the unique new nation that Jefferson helped found. Benjamin Henry Latrobe's watercolor shows the prominent siting of the Virginia capital, standing like the Parthenon on the Acropolis, high overlooking what was then the pokey town of Richmond. In choosing the capital site, Jefferson may have had Palladio's dictum for citing temples in mind. Palladio wrote in Book 4, quote, But we should choose sites for temples in the most dignified and prestigious parts of the city, far away from unsavory areas and on beautiful and ornate squares where many streets end, so that every part of the temple can be seen in all its majesty and arouse devotion and awe in whoever sees it and admires it. And if there are hills in the city, one should choose the highest part. Unquote. This directive is reflected in the siting of a number of America's civic temples, such as the Philadelphia Museum, the city's great temple of art, on a high hill and at the end of a great street. It's clearly evident in the positioning of our national capital, placed on Jenkins Hill, the district's promontory, at the end of a long mall, and with streets radiating from it. Jefferson's Temple on the Hill also established the precedent for using monumental classicism for America's civic architecture, resulting in scores of imposing piles from coast to coast, such as the U.S. Customs House in Charleston, Manhattan's New York County Courthouse, San Francisco's City Hall, Richmond's Broad Street Railroad Station, and the New York Stock Exchange, our leading temple of finance. All of this is part of a rich national legacy, and all owing something, either directly or indirectly, to Palladio's exposition on temples in Book 4. The next Book 4 entry for our discussion is the Basilica of Maxentius and Constantine, a large ruin on the east side of the Forum. It suffered two earthquakes long ago, causing the collapse of the main hall's vaults, but leaving intact the vaulted arches of the east side. This view by Piranesi is essentially how Palladio found it. Undeterred, Palladio set about making reasonably credible reconstruction drawings, placing them as his first entry in Book 4. Palladio, however, wrongly identified the structure as the Temple of Peace. Research has later determined that the building was not even a temple and accurately identified it as the basilica begun by the Emperor Maxentius and completed by the Emperor Constantine. For the Romans, a basilica was not a place of worship, but served as law courts and a place of public assembly. The actual Temple of Peace was in the nearby Forum of Augustus, of which little above ground remains. Since one of Palladio's motives for Book Four was to promote ancient temples as design sources for Christian churches, he convinced himself in thinking this was actually a temple, that its plan, with an apse at one end, was suitable for placing an altar, making it an ideal type of space for Christian worship. And indeed it proved to be, but well before Palladio, as we see in Ravenna's early Christian church of San Apollinari, with its basilica plan and apsidal end. In fact, the term basilica very soon became a designation applied to important Christian shrine or pilgrimage churches, such as St. Peter's Basilica. And Palladio himself engaged the character of the Basilica of Maxentius and Constantine for his design of the interior of San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice. Compare it with the reconstruction image of the interior of Rome's Basilica on the left. American Renaissance architects seized on the vaulted interior of the ancient Roman Basilica as a source of inspiration for grandiose works. 
A prodigious example is the main hall of Washington's Union Station. The station's octagonal ceiling coffers follow the design of the octagonal coffers of the Basilica of Maxentius and Constantine, as illustrated in Book 4. The Basilican character is interpreted with dazzling richness in the main hall of the Federal Reserve Bank in Cleveland, and shall we say it's a veritable shrine to mammon. And the lofty foyer of the Nebraska State Capitol is crowned by groin vaulting similar to what Palladio indicated originally covered the main hall of the Basilica of Maxentius and Constantine. We'll now turn to an Ionic temple. Palladio illustrated only two Ionic temples in Book 4. The Ionic columns seen here are the remains of what was long believed to be Rome's Temple of Concord. Research has since properly identified it as the Temple of Saturn. The ruin is situated in the Roman Forum, just below the Capitoline Hill. Piranesi's view shows a hodgepodge of later structures around its base, and this is pretty much as Palladio found it. Nevertheless, from his survey of the columns and remnants of the foundation, Palladio produced a restored elevation of the facade for Book Four. Now, the 18th century English aristocracy made a fad of sprinkling ornamental structures with classical references around their estates. The Earl Temple, now Temple was the Earl's surname, the Earl Temple had a reduced version of the Temple of Saturn built on the grounds of Stowe, the Earl's seat one of the grandest English country estates. The Earl is often credited as the designer. Since the actual temple's true identity had not been established by then, Stowe's version was originally named the Temple of Concord. Victory was later appended to its name. All right, we need to look once again at the Virginia State Capitol. In this view, we see a strong resemblance of the Temple of Saturn to the Virginia Capitol, and maybe it's not coincidental. Now Jefferson was in France when the Capitol was built, so he was unable to supervise its construction. It's been speculated that Samuel Doby, the Capitol's contractor and himself an architect, possessed a copy of Palladio's treatise and used it as reference for building an Ionic temple. Indeed, the Temple of Saturn made a better model to follow than the richly Corinthian Maison Carrée. Now, in the town of Assisi, north of Rome, Palladio recorded the intact Corinthian portico of the Temple of Minerva, now a church. He noted that it was the one ancient temple he had seen where the columns were set on pedestals. In the introductory to Book 4, Palladio derided placing portico columns on pedestals, stating, quote, But one does not see pedestals in ancient temples, and the columns are placed on their floors, which pleases me greatly, because not only do pedestals hinder access to the temple, but also columns which are based on the ground are more grand and magnificent, unquote. Now, perhaps Palladio was attempting to stress the point by making the Isisi temple pedestals taller in his drawing than they actually are. The vintage photo reveals the pedestals to be barely half the height of those in Palladio's depiction. And looking closely, we see the column bases really are level with the temple floor. The steps go between the pedestals. This is not what Palladio's drawing shows. Moreover, Palladio did not always follow his own advice. He made the column pedestals on the facade of San Giorgio Maggiore giant scale. But maybe we can excuse him here since the columns are not freestanding. Nevertheless, Palladio was generally right, particularly in the case of porticos with freestanding columns. The pedestals on the portico of this county courthouse do little to enhance the building's character nor do the column pedestals on our national capital add anything other than to make the portico look a bit fussy. So I think we can agree with Palladio's claim that columns without pedestals are indeed more grand and magnificent. Now, Palladio had a particular penchant for circular temples, such as the Pantheon. 
In Book 4, he declared the circular temple to be the most perfect and excellent one. He further stated, quote, Since its parts are identical to each other, all of them are contributing to the figure as a whole. And finally, since at every point the outer edge is equidistant from the center, it is perfectly adapted to demonstrate the unity, the infinite existence, the consistency, and the justice of God. Unquote. Of course, he's making the case that the circular temple is the ideal form for a Christian church. Palladio illustrated six ancient circular temples in Book 4, giving the most play to the Pantheon. And Palladio followed his own advice in his design for the Tempietto Barbaro, a chapel adjacent to his Villa Barbaro. Palladio's advocacy of circular planned churches struck a chord with James Gibbs. In a 1728 book of architecture, Gibbs published two schemes for circular churches as alternate designs for St. Martin in the Fields. Regrettably, neither of these innovative designs was built. However, Robert Mills designed a version of one for the Congregational Church in Charleston, which alas was destroyed in an 1861 fire. Two other circular temples published in Book 4 are restoration drawings for small temples encircled by columns. Palladio identified both as temples of Vesta, the goddess of home and hearth. Since the original temple of Vesta, located in the Forum, was known to have been round, it was assumed that any small round temple was dedicated to Vesta. However, scholarship has since determined that the temple on the left in Rome's Forum Boarium was originally dedicated to Hercules Victor. The temple on the right, located outside Rome in Tivoli, is also now believed to have been dedicated to Hercules. Now, neither temple survived with their original roofs. Palladio's addition to each of a saucer dome encircled with steps is conjectural, though not unreasonable. Even so, it's likely that Palladio cribbed his domes from Sebastiano Celio's woodcut of the Tivoli Temple published in his extensively illustrated Architectura. Celio's work was a compilation of classical details and designs published in sections between 1537 and 1570. But Serlio's drawings lack the conviction and precision of Palladio's, and we'll have more mention of Serlio later. So again, little evidence of a dome survived on either temple. The temple in Rome's Forum Boarium has been covered for centuries with a shallow tiled roof, and the Tivoli Temple remains a roofless but an exceedingly picturesque ruin, and this is how Palladio found each of them. Now, the smaller dome temple also became a favorite form for English 18th century garden follies. Except for the substitution of the Ionic order for Corinthian, the temple of ancient virtue, also in the gardens of Stowe, is a near replica of Palladio's drawing of the Tivoli temple. And certainly the most grandiose adaptation of the form is Nicholas Hawksmoor's mausoleum at Castle Howard. Another version is the 1821 monument to Sir Thomas Maitland, the Lord High Commissioner of the Ionian Islands, located on the island of Corfu. Its designer was Colonel George Whitmore of the Royal Engineers, and we can only speculate on whether Whitmore was familiar with Book 4 or if he was just inspired by what had become a popular form in Britain. Finally, the form can make an eye-catching accent as a cupola, as on this Atlanta synagogue by the noted architect Philip Trammell Schutze. Interestingly, one building that Palladio featured in Book 4 is not an ancient monument. Rather, it's a Renaissance one, Bramante's Tempietto. Palladio was so taken by this architectural jewel that he was moved to include it in his treatise. He placed it in Book 4 among his ancient temple drawings, he stated his rationale for doing this, writing, quote, Since Bramante was the first to make known that good and beautiful architecture, which has been hidden from the time of the ancients till now, I thought it reasonable that his work should be placed among those of the ancients. Accordingly, I have included the following temple 
designed by him on the Janiculum Hill. Unquote. Palladio was not the first to publish the Tempietto, but his drawings were more precise and his treatise was the most widely disseminated. So thanks to Palladio's book four, the Tempietto, with its distinctive tall drum, topped by a dome and encircled by a colonnade, all forming a design concept invented by Bermonte, became the prototype for innumerable great domes worldwide, from the Pantheon in Paris to St. Paul's in London, from Russia to Cuba, and some two dozen American state capitals, including California and Arkansas, Utah and Mississippi, to name a few, and of course culminating in our national capitals dome, which established a precedent for our state capitals. But we can thank Palladio for initiating the Fed with his praise of Bramante's Tempietto, written four and a half centuries ago in Book Four. Well, having discussed several of the major temples in Book Four, we can now turn to a sampling of the many classical details that Palladio incorporated in Book Four's pages. His published images of these ancient motifs have long served as design resources for architects and designers working in the classical tradition. And, as we will see, many of the details found their way into later architectural pattern books, further spreading their popularity. We'll first return to Palladio's elevation of the Temple of Portunus to examine a detail shown partially hidden under the portico, the console. Remember that the portico was walled in when Palladio surveyed it. Whether he found an original doorway and consoles intact within the encased portico is unknown, but it's unlikely. More likely, his depiction of the doorway and its consoles is informed conjecture. This fuzzy photo of the temple today shows glass and metal infill where a doorway should be. Nevertheless, Palladio's depiction of the Temple of Portunus Consul became a standard model for console design. The basic consul form can be viewed as a Corinthian modillion turned vertically. As for actual ancient consoles, we find them in situ in the doorway of the Maison Carré, albeit more richly treated than Portunus's console. The Maison Carré console is also illustrated in Book 4. Book four's images greatly encourage the use of consoles. Palladio set an example by attaching consoles to all four doorways of his Villa Rotunda. They were further popularized by 18th century pattern book authors such as Batty Langley. Gutsy 18th century consoles accent the front of the William Gibbs house in Charleston. American Renaissance architects rarely missed an opportunity to add consoles to their schemes. We see them on two works by the firm of McKean, Mead and White, New York's Metropolitan Club, and one of the firm's several buildings at Columbia University. And this Park Avenue apartment house sports a near replica of Palladio's Temple of Portunus Consul. The point is that consoles can be seen most anywhere. Innumerable consoles in a variety of designs and materials are available from today's architectural supply companies. Companies often describe them not as consoles, but corbels or brackets. But whatever we call them, I think we can credit Palladio for offering a handy template for console design in Book 4. For a very distinctive detail, we return to the Temple of Mars Altor as seen in Palladio's Book 4 elevation. Surviving among the temple's ruins was an unusual capital, decorated with pegasus, mythical winged horses that are symbols of fame and contemplation. The capital has been identified as one that originally crowned the pilasters in the temple's cellar. Palladio provided a drawing of it among the temple's details. The original capital is now preserved nearby in Rome's Market of Trajan Museum. A rare modern use of the Capitol is found on the 1912 Virginia General Assembly office building in Richmond, originally built for an insurance company. Its architect was Alfred Bossom of the New York firm of Clinton and Russell. Bossom accented the building's corner pilasters with Pegasus capitals, but Bossom also added an extra row of acanthus leaves, 
Otherwise, the capital is a faithful replication of Palladio's depiction. We'll look again at the Temple of Mars Ultra for another detail, one found in many places today. We're seeing the soffit of the temple's side colonnade. Looking closely, we see a fret which for convenience I've termed the complex Greek meander. The Greek meander can also be called a Greek fret or Greek key. It was a symbol of infinity. Palladio carefully recorded the soffit panel and published it in Book 4. The drawing clearly shows the fret ornamenting the panels. It also displays its complexity. I call it complex because it's really one fret overlaying with another. Palladio's publication of the detail spurred its popularity, particularly with British architects of the 18th century. James Gibbs included it among several architectural bands in his highly influential work, Rules for Drawing the Several Parts of Architecture of 1732. Other British architects joined the act and illustrated the fret among other designs for frets and decorations in their own pattern books. Two of the many examples are Batty Langley's Treasury of Designs and William Payne's The Builder's Companion. Both books were widely used by 18th century American builders. So it's not surprising to come across the meander or fret in fine colonial mansions such as Shirley or Drayton Hall. Becoming familiar with the motif, one can spot it in unexpected places, the frieze on Fifth Avenue's former Lord and Taylor store, or the necks of the Greek Ionic columns on the New Orleans Museum of Art, a reminder that the motif was originally used by the Greeks and often can be seen decorating Greek pottery. But we owe it to Palladio for nurturing awareness of it through Book 4. Looking again at the Mars Altar pages in Book 4, you may have noticed a detail on the page showing the Pegasus capital. In the center of the page is a small depiction of what has been defined as the Vitruvian scroll or Vitruvian wave. Up close we see that it does resemble a series of ocean waves. Now Vitruvius didn't invent the detail. He didn't even mention it in his ancient treatise. His name apparently was later assigned to it to signal its ancient origins. And we should note that Quattro Libre was not the first publication in which Palladio illustrated the Vitruvian wave. It appears in Daniele Barbaro's 1567 edition of Vitruvius's first century treatise. Because copies of the ancient treatise survived with no illustrations, Barbaro commissioned Palladio to execute the drawings for his book. We see Palladio's depiction of the Vitruvian wave decorating a column plinth. The Romans made frequent use of the Vitruvian wave. It highlights a mosaic floor in Pompeii. The Vitruvian wave is also seen on one of Palladio's own works, on the window sills of his Palazzo Chiricati. And as we've noted, Book 4 offered valuable source material for 18th century pattern book authors. In James Gibbs's plate showing the complex Greek meander scene earlier, the Vitruvian wave appears on the top row. The Vitruvian wave also became a common fixture of many 18th century Anglo-Palladian buildings. Lord Burlington applied it to Chiswick, his famous Palladian-style villa near London. It decorates the band capping the ground story. It also adds a lively touch to the palatial entrance hall in England's great country house, Holcomb Hall. In my hometown of Richmond, it appears on an exterior band of a state office building on Capitol Square and it caps the parapet of the National Postal Museum next to Union Station in Washington. Here the waves come crashing together. And we shouldn't rule out furniture. Gilded waves enrich the fascia of this regal pier table in England's Zion House. And a plainer version enlivens a neo-regency table. And I can't resist a personal note. Even my own great-grandmother, as a nine-year-old, stitched a Vitruvian wave as a border at the bottom of her 1837 sampler. Now, is Palladio responsible for all of this? 
Well, we can certainly say that he made the motif known through Book 4, resulting in its being widely disseminated. We'll look again at the famous columns of the Temple of Castor and Pollux for a detail that's often unnoticed. If we go in closer to the middle capital, we see that the center calicoli or stems are intertwined. This treatment may be unique to the Castor and Pollux Corinthian. Palladio recorded it with his restoration image for Book 4. We see its stems intertwined. But as far as we know, Palladio did not make use of this capital in any of his own works. Now, Sebastiano Serlio also illustrated the Castor and Pollux capital in his book appearing earlier, in 1537. And although Serlio's treatise was available in England, for the architects of England's 18th century Anglo-Palladian movement, Palladio's Quattro Libre was their primary and favorite source for classical design. So it's safe to assume that the movement's chief patron, Lord Burlington, referenced Palladio rather than Serlio when he chose to use the Castor and Pollux Corinthian for the portico of Chiswick, his villa outside London. Likewise, James Gibbs selected the Castor and Pollux Corinthian for the portico capitals of St. Martin in the Fields, one of his most famous works. The use of the order is sporadic in the United States, but it can be spotted occasionally. A rare antebellum example is found on Charleston's 1815 Trinity Methodist Church, a Meeting Street landmark. American Renaissance architects occasionally made use of the order. The firm of Hornblower and Marshall employed it for the portico columns of Washington's Museum of Natural History. And a surprising encounter with the order is to be had with Tokyo's Meiji Insurance Building, opposite the Imperial Palace. This monumental structure, completed in 1934, was designed by Shinichiro Okada, a professor of architecture at Tokyo's Imperial University. Now, the building survived the bombing of Tokyo, and following surrender, it was requisitioned by the U.S. command for offices. Interestingly, the late Robert Chittam, in his instructive textbook, The Classical Orders of Architecture, chose the Castor and Pollux capital with its intertwined calicoli as his ideal version of the Corinthian order. So we may hope this encourages a renewed interest in this distinctive capital design. For our final examination of a book for detail, we need to jump from Tokyo to western North Carolina to an 1806 plantation house called Rosedale in the Charlotte suburbs. Its exterior massing and two-level portico exhibit a modest Palladian influence, especially when we bookend it with Palladio's elevation of the Villa Canaro from Book 2. But for our detail, we have to look for Palladio's illustration of a section of frieze from the Temple of Saturn shown in Book 4. Here some shells alternate with some buds, both supported on linked escrows. The general character of this detail was picked up and adapted for a mantle frieze by William Payne and illustrated in his pattern book, The Practical House Carpenter. This book was published in London in 1787 and republished in Philadelphia in 1797. Loose pages from it, if not the whole book, found their way into the hands of many carpenters and joiners throughout the eastern seaboard. We see how the temple's escrolls have obviously been cribbed by Payne for his mantle design. And then we reveal how the Rosedale carpenters further simplified the Payne design for Rosedale's parlor frieze. But the connection with Palladio's Temple of Saturn detail is evident. All of this is to point out the far reach of Palladio's Book 4, both directly and indirectly, all the way from Saturn to Charlotte. Now, throughout this presentation, I have uttered many laudatory remarks about Palladio's achievements with Book Four. His treatise has been a source of inspiration from the day it was published. Yet, close examination of some of Book Four's images reveals that Palladio was not always completely accurate in his depiction of numerous details. 
We can speculate that Palladio relied on assistants to do some of the actual measuring for him, while he made notes and sketches as the information, maybe not always so precise, was called down to him. These discrepancies became evident a century later when a young French architect, Antoine Degaudet, was commissioned by French Minister of Finance Jean-Baptiste Colbert to visit Rome and study the ruins in order to produce an architectural source book for French practitioners. Degaudet's determination to achieve a more precise documentation of the ancient works is noted in his own words. Quote, for I found means during sixteen months I was in Rome to draw with my own hand those ancient structures of which I have given the plans, elevations, and profiles, with all the measures which I have exactly taken. I have verified the whole over and over in order to obtain a certainty for which I could answer." Unquote. Degaudet's extensive fieldwork culminated in his 1682 compendium titled, in translation, The Ancient Buildings of Rome, Drawn and Measured Very Exactly. This was a monumental and beautifully illustrated work that remains reliable today for the accuracy of its documentation. Referencing numerous entries in Palladio's Book IV, Degaudet methodically explains where Palladio missed the mark in his recording. We'll look at three. The first involves our friend the Temple of Fortunus. Here we focus on its frieze. In these details we see Palladio showing garlands of fruit and vegetables held by playful putti alternating with ox skulls. Degaudet writes that the garlands are not fruit and vegetables but are thinner swags of oak leaves. Moreover, Degaudet shows Roman candlesticks at intervals. Palladio includes no candlesticks. Well, who's right? Well, only a tiny section of the actual frieze survives. Though worn and broken, we can see in this dim photo that the swags are definitely not lush garlands of fruit and vegetables, but are much thinner and are hanging from a Roman candlestick. And we can just make out the oak leaves. And Palladio ignores the candlesticks altogether. So score one for Degaudet. Next, standing near the center of the forum are the portico columns of the temple of Antoninus in Faustina. Its former cella is now occupied by an early Christian church with a Baroque exterior. As with Portunus, we are focusing on the frieze, which is decorated with griffins, mythological beasts having the head and wings of an eagle and the body of a lion, symbols of strength and courage. Palladio shows his griffins with their tails curved upwards. Degaudet's griffins have their tails dragging. Or well, who's right? Well, let's look at the actual freeze. Tails dragging. Degaudet wins again. And we can only wonder why Palladio overlooks something so obvious. And Thomas Jefferson, being the loyal Palladium, selected Palladio's version of the Temple's frieze for his hall frieze at Monticello, even though he did own a copy of Degaudet's book. Our third example is the round temple at Tivoli, also discussed earlier. We see the temple's romantic ruin and Palladio's conjectural restoration. Palladio shows skulls in the frieze. Degaudet has intact heads and more refined garlands with a rosette above each. Palladio has no rosettes. Also, their respective capitals are very different. Palladio shows a generic Corinthian capital. Degaudet's capital has oversized flarons and compressed rows of acanthus leaves. Moreover, Degaudet's column flutes are squared off at the top, whereas Palladio's are rounded. Well, who's right here? You guessed it, Degaudet. The actual details are pointed out here. As we said, Degaudet measured everything himself. Now, I don't mean to denigrate Palladio with these observations. He remains almost deified anyway. His book four was a pioneering work, opening people's eyes to the beauty and majesty of ancient classical architecture as never before. And we should look at Degaudet as a refinement of Palladio's effort, and indeed a very meticulous one. 
Fortunately, an English translation of Degaudet's book is finally available in inexpensive reprint. If one is incorporating specific ancient Roman details into modern work, one should definitely check Degaudet. Well, the time allowed for this lecture has permitted me to offer only a brief overview and examination of the extraordinary quantity of material contained in Palladio's Book Four. So I hope this presentation will encourage further mining of this book's many resources and will enrich your appreciation of Palladio's impact on the classical tradition, both here and abroad. And I also hope it might serve to inform new classical design. I'm Calder Loth, and I appreciate this opportunity to share this facet of Palladiana with you, and I encourage you to continue to enjoy and learn from the Institute of Classical Architecture and Arts many online offerings. Thank you.